We have just released issue 4 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring life in the ashram of Adidasamraj. My guest is Julie Anderson, a former Playboy centerfold model who was an intimate companion of the spiritual master Adida for 16 years from 1976 to 1992. During those years, she was considered an individual of high spiritual attainments and was known as Kanya Samarpana Remembrance and also Swami Dhamma Dalotara Devi and a number of other names. Adi Da has also been known by many other names, including Da Lavananda, Baba Frijan, the Ruchira Avatar, and Franklin Jones. His writings have been highly praised by many thoughtful students of spirituality, including the philosophers Alan Watts, Jeffrey Kripal, and Ken Wilbur. Adida died in November of 2008. Julie left the spiritual community founded by Adida in 1992 after a deep process known as reality consideration. Julie lives in Australia, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Julie. It's a pleasure once again to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. I really have enjoyed our last conversation, and I'm so happy to be here again. I'm delighted to be with you. I think you really opened up a window for our viewers to understand what it was like, at least to get a glimpse of, of what it was like living in the household of a spiritual master. Now, in this conversation, I hope we can go a little deeper and uh, talk about more of the nuances. And one thing that you mentioned to me before we began, which I think is worthy of mention now, so that it's very clear with our viewers that when you left the ashram in 1992, that did not end your relationship with Adida. Yes, yes. That's true. I can, the relationship has continued and will continue. Uh, I simply was not in the Fijian ashram, but then went into different aspects of relating to devotees and his work throughout the world gathering and on different ashrams in Northern California or Hawaii, um, up in Seattle or in, uh, there's a couple ashrams in Northern California and then with devotees in different parts of the world. So I serve in different ways, but still in direct relationship to him and his instruction and guidance and our, um, communications back and forth. And then often I would return back into his household or in the ashram in different manners. And that was uh, important, as important as the time that I actually spent in his household for those 17 years. He died in 2008, which would have been another 16 years after. So, you spent, in effect, 16 years in his intimate company and 16 years in a more or less on and off uh, association. Yes, correct. And then as important is now the 14 years, close to 14 years after he passed away. And each of those periods of time are very significant in direct relationship to the spiritual process itself, the transcendental spiritual process itself. Yes. So I'm assuming by that, that since he left the body in 2008. You've still felt uh, regular communication with him. 
Yes, and in many different ways. Uh, actually, in all of life, no matter who I relate to or what I'm doing, the, the presence of his transmission, the spirit presence, and also the manner in which I know him intimately at heart, and then also the instruction that was given directly, and then also through the written teaching and other forms of what he has given as gifts that communicate about the process that he initiated for everyone. So I find that um, everyone and everything that I relate to is a teacher to me because I recognize the, the single oneness of our manifestation as being itself. Um, and so I've, I'm constantly learning uh, in relationship to life. And the, as I mentioned before, the, the, um, the constant is always what was the transmission of the divine self condition or consciousness itself um, that is also unqualified love bliss, unqualified light. So in that context of the relationship and the revelation of being that is not separate from anyone or anything, but inclusive of it, I'm always learning, um, you know, through what's called heart intelligence. And this is uh, the nuances of how that uh, as he, the words he uses is radical understanding uh, or perfect knowledge. There's a lot of language around it, but really the fundamental certainty of it is wordless and speechless because it's a transmission, a profound um, awakening into a, a context that is not just focused in the body-mind or psychophysical nature. Mm -hmm. Well, in our last conversation, uh, you talked about how part of Adida's teachings had to do with the notion of a cult and, and that he did not want his, his devotees and other followers to treat him as, as a cult leader. Uh, he didn't want to create a cult. And yet, it seems to me it would be pretty hard not to see the uh, Adi Dam, the organization that uh, he left behind, as, as something uh, of a, a cult following a Hindu style uh, religion around a spiritual master and having a, a variety of rituals and practices associated with that. It seems sort of paradoxical that it had all the trappings of a cult, and at the same time, the spiritual master is saying he didn't want it to be a cult. Yes. <laughs> that is the trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're, the way that you're speaking of it is a more broad and intelligent an informed way of relating to the terminology of a cult. Um, as I touched on last time that we spoke was, and this isn't just an event that has occurred with Adi Dham and Adi Da's work, but many uh, spiritual teachers, even in the streams of the most conventionally accepted religions in the world, have been targeted in terms of being called cults. And that has the most negative connotation in the media as being something that is just absolutely horrifying and amoral, um, you know, coercive and manipulative and all of that. And there are organizations and, and people who have functioned that way. And that is absolutely anathema. I mean, absolutely not okay. And, but, and that, that word does not in any way, shape, or form in that context or in that description apply to what we did with Adi Da and how Adi Da worked. However, that being said, there are um, roots that are common with everyone that has the liability to function in a cultic fashion. And this has to do with the unique manner in which Adi Da worked to undo the cult. Um, and at root, a cult comes about by virtue of relating to life 
in, as an I other manifestation. Um, and I'm not talking about that in terms of the convention of speech, you know, just to refer to the fact that I am speaking to you. I'm speaking about it at a more depth feeling of the being, a sense of identity that is irre- somehow or other considered to be completely independent of everyone and everything. And this points to living life in relationship to everyone and everything as being somehow other and you're not connected with it, you're separate from it, and you're not inherently dependent and combined or inter- interconnected. So when we relate to life and other through the act of separation as an ego act, that is not in relationship, fully heart open and available to feel and combine with and willing to consider things with and feel differing views and different qualities and such, then the, 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 the liability is that if we're not doing that, then we want to fight for and define our own position and control it, and own it, and um, anyone that doesn't agree with you, you are in opposition to. So basically living life in relationship to the world as an opponent, or as a victim. All of these kinds of dynamic is what creates the cult, and that a cult can be lived even in relationship to your own body, your own body-mind, you know, the feeling awareness of being, being aware of the body-mind, if you relate to that as an other, you create a cultic dynamic where you're constantly dealing with problems that seem insurmountable, and you're trapped in that duality dynamic. Same with an intimate relationship. You can live that as a cult, cult of pairs, or there can be a cult of three, there can be a cult of a hundred, there can be a cult of thousands, a nation becomes a cult, a club becomes a cult, a religion becomes a cult, you know, a movie, you can create a movie (laughs) that's cultic. I mean, it's just relating to life as an objective other. So that's a a fundamental understanding that Adi Da really, really worked constantly hard to undo because it's that radical understanding of non-duality is core and fundamental to his teaching and the transmission of what he describes as the one and only single condition that is the self-condition true of everyone and everything. So that we're all in that awake as the self-position and source condition as one. And if that is actually felt, then it has the possibility or potential of undermining conflict, undermining the potential of being unavailable to be able to be feelingly sympathetic or compassionate or cooperative or tolerant in the context of a world that has so many vast possibilities and differing experiences and different forms of learning, different forms of karma, different DNA, um, different knowledge, different experience. So all of these differences are there to be observed and felt and understood and not reacted to. Well, when you left the organization in Fiji, where, where you had been a resident, at at that point, if I recall correctly, you described Adi Da as being very unsatisfied with the success of his mission as the Ruchira avatar, that he had expected more. But if, if I recall correctly, it, it was as if he, he felt that the community around him, including the most advanced practitioners, were were still caught up in in their ego identities to some extent they were not r- realizing the the goal of advaita vedanta of of oneness and that was creating a, a cult like situation yes so i can speak about myself then in this regard um cuz that criticism was true and 
and remains to be true to a certain degree and in relationship to my growth and and understanding at this point. Uh, And that has to do with the fact that Adidas' teaching and his communication via his gifts and his transmission as a Siddha guru, uh, a transmission master, is that he awakens us all as he has realized and in relationship to all realizers and the divine condition itself that is manifested through time and space. His intention and purpose was to help us be able to awaken to a condition that is prior to and beyond just the point of view that we tend to identify in this cosmic domain as the universal domain of experience and possibility. And when he first began to teach or communicate about this, even in relationship to the masters or realizers that had helped him along the way of his process in sadhana, that there was a a difficulty in being able to really grasp or understand what it was that he was communicating because it seemed to be an affront to what had been established as the accepted perspective from which we would engage life. Holding on to a separate self-identity, I-other identity, and all the forms in which this had manifested throughout time and space and history and cultures, that to begin to say there's something beyond this that we need to establish all of us into to be able to be at rest and to bring about a peace and a happier world and continue to grow spiritually, he noticed that people were not prepared because... Um, as is understood traditionally in a real spiritual process that has to do with if you're a truly religious practitioner. that And this is always determined by the values and virtues of the heart itself, no matter what kind of religious or spiritual practice or tradition you've been engaged in. the, The heart domain, the domain of love itself, is the measure of the integrity of any process. So if you're a religious practitioner or a yogic practitioner or even a uh, truly spiritual practitioner or a mystic or a great philosopher or a gyani um, or a, a, a guru or a practitioner or a devotee, all of those roles or functions or experiences have to be measured in the heart domain. And the psychophysical structure of our beings are all the same in terms of how we view the world and how we conceive it or perceive it. How it's in terms, I'm talking in structural terms, like the mechanism itself, not the content or what you your opinion or you view or how you may value it. I'm talking about the actual structural mechanism. Now, this may sound a bit esoteric to try to answer your question, but it's really the best way to do it because it speaks at root to what um, was the limit that he had to keep pointing out to us, is that our structural mechanisms were not prepared to receive the force of that transmission that would actually establish the feeling being in the domain of consciousness itself. Because for that to occur, it requires the willing participation of the student, the practitioner, or the devotee, or even the accomplished advanced practitioner to constantly engage in the reciprocal process of surrender or letting go of what you are attached to as if it is necessary to hold on to for realization itself or to live a life that is truly about love and love bliss. There's the constant liability in the being no matter how much you have experienced in the broad spectrum of 
human, religious, or spiritual, or transcendental life, no matter what you've experienced, if the heart itself is not open and then allows the structure, the whole bodily being to be open in relationship to everyone and everything, no matter what the experience is, without qualification, then you constrict or do not allow the current of life or love bliss itself to do its work. Well, I take from what you're saying that there should be no difference between life in the world and life in the ashram, that um, it's all one. Exactly, exactly. Or, or life as you may experience it as an accomplished yogi, mystic, philosopher, intellectual, teacher, or whatever circumstance you may find yourself in. And that's why my time when I was not in the ashram, and you could use the word um, cloister, you know, you, you could use the, it was, it was a set apart. As in many traditions, you have renunciates, monks and nuns, uh, you know, people who are so dedicated to that specific form of process that they don't, they are no, they are relieved of the responsibility to have to function in the world in the fashion that most people do. However, how is that kind of a process going to actually relate to the, uh, a, a transmission or a revelation within which it is all inclusive? So there has to be the communication that this is available and can be practiced without the methods of rigorous seeking that have been available. This process is applicable and available to everyone and everything. Why? Because it's the very context of our existence. Well, while you were in the ashram, you did have the opportunity to live something of a cloistered life. You described in our previous interview that there were times when you could spend practically all day in meditation. And as a result of that, you pointed out that you experience many different kinds of samadhi. And that phrase stuck with me, all the different kinds of samadhi. I uh, would be very happy to hear more about that. Yeah, that's wonderful to speak about. And when I speak about this, I'll be speaking about things that are uh, not unfamiliar to thousands and thousands of people who have had similar experiences, but in different contexts and in different traditions and throughout time and space, as has been communicated, you know, in different forms. And the fact that I was able to do that was an extraordinary blessing. I, I feel the, the incredible gift of that and am indebted to the um, individuals who made that possible, you know, that I was supported to be able to live that kind of focused life and, and concentrate my life in, in what's traditionally called samyama, consideration, uh, a, a focus of experimentation and investigation um, into the actual um, esoteric anatomy of the whole bodily being and its relationship to life and to spirit and to traditions and like study of that and to actually live that with a spirit, an accomplished and awakened spiritual teacher and master. Um, that was, it's an extraordinary gift. And I know again, there are many people who can speak about this opportunity. And I can speak about it specifically in relationship to Adi Da. I'm really sad that Adi Da passed on when he did, because I know that he wanted to continue to be embodied, to be able to see the fruition of all of what he had worked with in, in those of us and, and those who knew of him or may have felt him and not even be able to call it by name. <laughs> <laughs> as is often the case, you know, with a lot of um, 
things people may experience in life, and they don't know what to call it, but they know that it's grace. <laughs> um, or some, like, how did that happen? <laughs> or what was that experience about? <laughs> the mystery of it all. So when I was there, I was um, in a, a situation in which that mystery was constant because it was a place that was um, sacredly set apart for that purpose. So you know how when you go into any kind of a space, just even the room that you're in right now, you're attuned to being very careful to set it up in a manner in which will help you to do what you are skilled at and artfully have a heart impulse to do. And so you take into account all the little nuances around it. And likewise, in an ashram or in a, a temple or a sacred space, I mean, you can even feel this when you go into like a library or a museum or an art gallery, you know, or a theater, or many different situations in which the space itself is set up to serve a specific purpose. And if you've gone into empowered places that have been sacredly empowered, either by actual articles that somehow are imbued with the force of a um, energy that is really strong. Um, oftentimes people might use crystals this way or, uh, yeah, um, all sorts of different um, relics of different kinds. Well, also, there is what's called invocation. And these are practices that occur in all traditions. Prayer. Making use of music or art or architecture, you know, to establish spaces that are conducive to religious and spiritual practice. So I lived in that kind of a setting in a number of different ashrams. And I also had the opportunity to help Adi Da with an, um, a very large number of other devotees also participate in doing this with him. Extraordinarily amazing process because being an artist with certain sensitivities, that was a, 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 an extraordinary education because the way that the ashrams came into being again was through study of the different traditions um, and, and how this occurred and then measuring how do we establish our ashram and our relationships with Adi Da and with one another in a manner that actually honors and respects and conducts this unique process of bright the transmission of conscious light. So when I was there, um, it, the, everything that happened, as I described before, in all those years of being around him 24-7, whether I was like physically in the room or not, I was living with him and under his direct guidance with a number of people. The force of his transmission was always present. That was the... the what we always felt in relationship that what we did and his presence is uh, establishes us in the context that's not separated from or focused in trying to achieve a specific experience okay and so when when his transmission comes down into the being and then circles around and establishes what he describes as the samadhi of the thumbs it's an all-inclusive context that then ends up um, evoking or bringing to your feeling being and triggers, um, brings light into various aspects of the psychophysical biography of the ego and the structural anatomy, the esoteric anatomy. So in my own being, I learned over all the years, and I'm still learning, about various um, things that I have experienced in time and space that instruct me about the possibilities of being embodied 
and not just embodied grossly, but also embodied in different levels or manifestations or vibrations of experience. So I, and I, what I described to you bef- that I experienced before even coming into his physical company, that was the beginning or the initiation of what's described as the samadhi of the thumbs. And the thumbs is something he coined when he was a young boy because it was something he experienced at a very young age. And which is a, it, which is the incredible force of the spiritual presence pressing down into the being and the heart responding to the feeling of love bliss opening up and then also going up the back of the body and bringing you full circle. And as it comes around, it establishes you in a spherical form of being. And you realize, and this is the samadhi of it, that you're not actually just identified with this fleshy structure, that your conscious awareness is actually much beyond just the physical body. And as you know, and many of your the people you've spoken to have communicated, and millions of people have experienced, that the world is more than what we look like or what we can see, okay? Which is a really important realization. So a samadhi is a, a satori, um, you know, a profound yogic, realization, um, but specifically ac- according to certain traditions, there are samadhis that also occur in relationship to the chakras in the body-mind and um, and correspond in relationship to Adi Da's work, again, in relationship to the right and the middle and the center stations of the heart. <laughs> Am I making, am I speaking clearly enough? Well, well, you're speaking in vague terms, although you mentioned the chakras, for example. I think many of our viewers will be familiar with the chakras. I certainly wouldn't expect you to explain that. But uh, let let me say this. I had a dear friend who was a member of that community, and one day he came to visit me. And he said to me, when we meditate, he, he said, we don't meditate. He meditates us. Right. Yes. Yes. So that, what that means is, is, as I'm describing that, um, the heart, like the heart, the, the transmission of the heart actually moves through this structure. And so, when we're sitting in meditation or in life or wherever we are, and this is what happened when I was living with him, I was always noticing that something was being revealed, both about the nature of my liability to do this in relationship to life, which is an expression of being unlove or recoiling from life, or I was open, open to, turned out into Life And in doing that, then the transmission would um, illuminate all the different possibilities that I could experience. And so, for example, when I was in Adida's company in the late 70s and we went to Hawaii um, shortly after I arrived, I had an unexpected experience. And it's called Kachari Mudra. And it is a form of a yogic samadhi where the, um, related to the throat chakra and then to the, um, pineal gland in the brain, um, the, the force of the transmission or the spirit current then dri- ends up coming down so forcibly that the, the tongue goes back into the, behind the palate. It's not like I wasn't intending to do it. It was a spontaneous manifestation of reaching back behind and up. And then the tongue was actually touching what is called a nectarous 
flower or chakra in the body within which the, the nectar of love bliss or the spirit current was dripping down into my throat, all the way through my body, all the way down to the base of my body, and I was completely in a... As I, as I describe it, I can still feel it because the, that nectar is always flowing because that's actually the current that is keeping us alive. And um, in traditional terms, oftentimes yogis will spend decades attempting to achieve these various forms of mudras, yogic mudras, to be able to experience and taste the nectar. Whereas in Adi Da's company, I was given these experiences without effort. In other words, I didn't have to practice a lot of yoga for that to be spontaneously given. Um, that's one, one example. Um, a, another one is the, um, a similar kind of experience where his transmission would come down. And this occurred very early on also, as I described, relative to feeling, um, a perpetual sustenance that was not dependent upon, uh, what I ate, what I didn't eat, um, my sense of how I appeared in the world, it was all associated with the anorexic bulimic syndromes, um, eating disorders, which are all about a relationship to life or not, and a, a right open relationship to life, or a neurotic one, or an addictive one. Um, and I remember the day in which... Um, s suddenly there was, um, again, just being in his... Um, around him and being with devotees or being in these sacred spaces, I began to notice is that my navel, like the knot in my navel, um, was loosening. You know, the kind of knot you get over your solar plexus when you're anxious or you're something, you're afraid of something and you can feel it and you can feel it. Oh, it's just hard. You were describing, of course, you were talking about the throat just then, and you used the phrase the nectar. And I know you described it in such a manner as to imply that it was actually some form of liquid that was flowing down your throat. Is that is that correct? Well, it, it felt like it was a, a liquid. Whether it was or wasn't, I wasn't um, uh, making that kind of um, visceral observation at the time that it was occurring. It was, it was more that it was a nectar that wasn't just, it was happening physically because of the, of the mudra that occurred, but it also, the bliss that, the, that was permeating the being, what was, is what was more prominent. But the one with the navel that I was speaking about that actually ends up opening and relaxing, um, again, through the transmission that is prior to the experience itself, it allows these all of the chakras to open, so you experience the different blisses or the different abilities or the different um, uh, ways that it informs you in terms of how to relate to life differently than if the chakras are either constricted or contracted or if... Um, you are focusing energy and attention on the chakra in order to achieve an experience. So my the forms of samadhis that I experienced in, in Adi Da's company were given because of the illumination uh, that is inherent in bright yoga that's called um, Atma Shadi, Atmanadi Shakti Yoga of the bright. Um, so it's the Shakti or the energy of the Atmanadi Shakti or the bride itself that illuminates these centers that are um, associated with every level of the being. And so um, I would have experiences of another samadhi that's called um, cosmic consciousness um, that has to do with the opening of the, the third eye um, and, and beyond where... In, again, in a in a moment where I remember where I I remember exactly where I was, and and this hasn't just occurred once. This would have, these kinds of things would occur repeatedly, um, such that 
in the space of being outside in an occasion where there was just lots of devotees and um, he was there and we were chanting at that time, if I remember correctly. And we engaged in a lot of different forms of singing and dancing and and such, um, ecstatic dancing, like Sufis dance and different ways of being moved in the spirit. And um, then suddenly, without like an intention to cause this, there was an expansive opening um, in and above and beyond the head that then allowed me to feel, again, the interconnectedness with everything. You know, that there was just light. There was just an illumination of light, and everything that was moving around me was just these beautiful forms of lights and and beings and... and, um, Joy, um, and that, and not separate. No one was separate in that at all. And 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 realizing and feeling, even if as attention and energy in different moments when I would have this experience again, also that um, it was permeating and moving me into being aware that there were passageways within which you could move into to feel this that weren't um, the same as just going from where I'm sitting now into the down the hallway in in another room, but in fact there are in the above the brows, and and I'm not speaking about just merely um, like as if you're going up into the sky, but, um, but described as the sky of mind, that there's infinite numbers of possible doorways or passageways that I entered into, you know, at, at different moments in time to be able to experience what people will describe um, about having a relationship to somebody who's not physically embodied or hearing communications from somebody who's not physically embodied. So the, these kinds of experiences um, were not uncommon. They were actually fairly common. And uh, an, another one also that occurred, I was in Hawaii, and another samadhi, which is called um, Ascended Nirvikalpa Samadhi, is that uh, just one day after coming home from going to the beach, a beautiful day at the beach, and coming home and lying down on the bed afterwards, and suddenly uh, the whole being is just brought out of the body. And the body, the whole sense of being in a physical body is entirely let go. And yet, I'm awake. I'm, I'm still conscious. I'm still awake. And all there is is just infinite light. Infinite light. Absolute freedom. Infinite light. Completely forgetting everyone and everything in this joy of ascension. Okay? And then back into the body, and yet that brilliance or that that energy of, of light, the profundity of it then had stayed with me, you know, in, in terms of like, I have to tell you about how amazing, you know, we are light, there is only light, we, we, we descend from the light, you know, <laughs> and, I, and it was like absolute freedom. So that, that's another form of an experience, that's a samadhi. Um, another one is what's called Savakalpa Samadhis. And these Savakalpa Samadhis are even more ascended than what you might experience through the passageways that I was describing to you um, that are associated um, with the brain, mind, and above. There's also Savakalpa Samadhis which go into realms where you um, experience or feel combined with um, colors like indistinct forms. Um, there's one that's called the blue bindu, or there's also the going through or penetrating the star form, um, and also the rings of the rainbow colors around. It, it's just like shapes and forms and sounds and lights, and again, it doesn't have a defined kind of a way of familiarity with 
what we see in finite forms, but you actually realize that this physical body is, at a, in a more primal sense and related to light itself, it's actually just made of vibratory light, vibratory sound. And that revelation comes through forms of, of realization of penetrating the bindu and going above and beyond. I'm speaking here in specific terms that um, are, again, as you say, more broad or general, but the um, specific experiences that I had are not unique to me. And one of the things that occurred around Adi Da is that Everybody had different experiences, and some people would have certain experiences of a kind a lot. <laughs> and other devotees would have other experiences that were different, and they'd have them a lot. And some people didn't have hardly any experiences at all, and, and, and would be really frustrated about the fact that they didn't have experiences. And whereas some people would be having so many experiences, it would be annoying, you know, get to the point where it was ridiculous. And that was part of what Adida was working with in terms of combining with the fact that everybody has experiences all the time. So the seeking of these experiences and the samadhis was not actually the point of our process in relationship to him. Even the, even the experiences that yogis, saints, and sages and have sought to experience throughout time, because these experiences do inform you. And if you're a true spiritual practitioner and continue to do the sadhana within any tradition that's associated with these samadhis, then there can be a sustaining of the nectar or the bliss that actually informs you in terms of how to live. Um, so we learned all of this um, in, in the context of being in the ashram, and we examined all of these um, experiences, um, yogic, mystical, spiritual. And then it, the another samadhi, of course, that I had was um, Gyana Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And this is associated with what the Gyanis experience as the non-dual self or the Atman, and, and this was actually um, an aspect of practice that I practiced the most, which um, would tell me something about my being at, um, in terms of its deeper personality or the soul or various experiences that I may have had in previous lifetimes, that I gravitated towards experiences that were established in the causal knot. Of being. The causal knot is associated with the right side of the heart, and the subtle knot is associated with the center of the heart, and the left side of the heart is characterized as the gross being, or the gross knot. And all of these knots were being undone through the, the transmission of the bright, and then synchronously associated with the psychobiography of the ego. So with me, when I practiced the, um, the sixth stage yoga, um, which is again another matter to talk about when I refer to sixth stage, um, because if you study Adi Da's teaching, he describes the seventh stage process in relationship to the six stages of life. These six stages of life are just ways of describing, again, a way of a tool to um, be able to understand the structural mechanisms and the heart and the dimensions of existence, the developmental responsibilities of the being, and how to function in relationship to these responsibilities and, and experiences. Um, so the seven stages of life are associated also then with the chakras, it's just his, um, the tool that he offered, you know, in the form of his teaching for people to relate to these possible experiences. So when I was, um, after 1986, I was initiated in, into sannyas as a swami. And um, this, is a, this is amusing, Jeffrey, because what we did is we would um, 
we didn't just have these experiences and study about them. We took on the whole costume of it. <laughs> so we would take on the costume of actually embracing the yoga as a Gyani Sanyasan. As if, say, I was in the Jain tradition or I was a devotee of, you know, Ramana Maharshi or some non-dual, you know, practice where there was a complete letting go of, of engaging in certain functional aspects of the being. Like we didn't, we fasted for a long time and we didn't eat very much. We ate very simply, um, we're celibate, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in meditation, um, and, and synchronous with that, though, we did fulfill the responsibilities of, of um, you know, taking care of one another in the environment and the ashram and services that we did there. But um, at this time, I spent a lot of time in, in meditation and in contemplation and in study around this. And um, I actually it was in the, the samadhi that established me prior to the not in the right side of the heart. Now, this yoga is not one that's really commonly understood because people are more um, interested in the fascinated experiences that you can have in kundalini yoga, uh, where kundalini yoga actually has more to do with the subtle heart and how the subtle heart and the experiences therein can actually grant you experiences that are pleasurable. Whereas with the, um, the yoga of the Gyani and the awakening in the, um, of the Atman, it's actually a null and void. There's no experience except for the bliss of the heart itself. And so all sense of phenomenal awareness and the sense of the psychophysical structure falls away. <laughs> I'm under the impression from your descriptions that um, on the one hand, these states of samadhi are not permanent. It's like being on the high wire or something. You can't stay there forever. But on the other hand, they leave you permanently changed. Yes, yes. And, and that also, the, 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 the permanence of it would depend on a few matters. One is that what is the transmission of the the teacher and the master and the and the sangha and the ashram or the circumstance that you're in so that you're being constantly imbued and reignited in that understanding or that yoga or are you actually doing the practice and the sadhana required for that awakening to be sustained and the purpose of it so that requires a real serious aspirant to sustain the practice. And, and also would be the matter of to what degree are you able to be self-disciplined and living what would allow the mechanism of the body-mind to conform to what was revealed in that. Um, so there is a knowledge that can be sustained but I noticed that for myself, that was, and this was really frustrating, is that while there was an abundance of these experiences, the ability to be able to hold on to the bliss <laughs> or the nectar or whatever it was that I was hoping that I was going to be able to sustain, suddenly it was just there was nothing you could do to hold on to it. It was like no matter how hard I tried, <laughs> I couldn't get back to that no matter how hard I tried to do that, so that it soon became clear to me that while there were these profound possibilities and these profound experiences, that for me personally, I wasn't born as a, an accomplished yogi. You know, some people are actually born this way, Lit literally so. There are people who are granted these experiences and then can teach them. You know, they, their life is devoted to that, and they are unique beings. I'm not that kind of person. That's not what my um, karmas were about coming into this embodiment. Um, and also is that uh, I was, by habit, an addict, like not a disciplined personality. 
And so my energy and attention would wander, you know, into desiring something different. Whereas, you know, for some people to sustain this, um, the bliss of these samadhis that aren't associated with just eating something that you enjoy and getting pleasure that way, this pleasure or enjoyment is within the etheric or astral or higher mind or psychic dimension or higher dimensions that are revealed through the various samadhis that how the heck am I going to maintain that? (laughs) But what was extraordinary is that these were gifts were given for free and they weren't taken away. It was just that they, because there were constant possibility. These, these realms and these samadhis and these experiences are available to anyone. It just depends upon whether you're available for them, what you associate with, whether you receive the transmission, whether you're in a culture, whether you do the sadhana, whether you're seeking that, how you want to make use of it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it could be. But the frustration was the important part because there was a seeking to want to experience something again. And that is a, a crux of what Adida describes as radical self-understanding is that once you are seeking for something outside the self-position, you actually separate yourself from that which is inherently blissful and always already the case. That's a language that he will use as he describes the realization of the self-condition. It's always already the case. If you seek for something else outside that position and condition, you separate yourself from it, and then you become this, seeking for it through experiential possibilities. You described in our previous interview, if I recall correctly, that you and some of the other advanced practitioners would have experiences that you described, I think, as seventh stage experiences, which in, in Adidas system, that would be sort of the ultimate. But then you would find yourself back in the first three stages of life still dealing with other unresolved problems. Okay, that's a really important question because it indicates to me that you're, you're hearing something about very clearly what I'm communicating, which is important to me. Um, because, um, it's not easy to grasp these esotericisms. And I would think that your availability to it has a lot to do with your being available to feel and think outside the square. <laughs> <laughs> And the vast amount of experiences that you have had in terms of your relationship to people in your own life and and process, which I don't know a lot about, but I'm I'm just grateful that you asked that question because that's fundamental to the entire process and relationship to him, to um, his life story, or what we call a Leela, um, which is a divine story, and also our relationship to him while he was embodied and after his death. And it is exactly what we are dealing with as a gathering, is that we were constantly given the transmission of the seventh stage realization. And again, the truth of the matter is, is that you can't hold on to it. It does require the foundation preparation of the mechanism of the body-mind to be free of the bondage that energy and attention draws you into if it is identified with the ego act. And that is no easy process. It is a profound process. And it, it, and it can't even define in anyone's particular unique manifestation, even through lifetimes, at the point at which that perfect and permanent awakening will take hold. It's an entire unknown because it doesn't, it's not willed into being. It's not a program that you do this, 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 and this, and you achieve it. It doesn't happen that way. And it also refers back to your um, friends saying to you, when we sit in meditation or receive the darshan or the transmission, it is being conducted or done by the realizer or the process of the transmission itself. 
So, yes, many of us actually did. And this occurred prior um, to moving to the island in Fiji, where there were many devotees who Adida acknowledged as seventh stage practitioners, a large number. And it was an incredible celebration because it was, <laughs> I mean, this was, you know, a couple decades for some who had been around. For myself, I haven't been that long. But these uh, devotees who he did acknowledge for this transition, they were experiencing what was called the consistent awakening into the feeling of being, no matter what was arising, it was never lost. So the, the seventh stage realization is being consciously awake in the consciousness domain that is inclusive of everyone and everything, simultaneously, consistently combined with love bliss itself, the nectar of love bliss itself, that is one and the same as consciousness itself. So the, the realization of the seventh stage non-dual gift or condition of the self is no difference whatsoever between consciousness and love bliss itself. You're consciously awake and being able to live as love bliss, perpetually, never lost. <laughs> that is happiness. That is freedom. That is joy. And that's the gift of his transmission. And that was his demonstration and what we felt in the process of living with him and seeing him demonstrate that no matter what he was associating with and no matter how he was working, even in the midst of all of the emotions being expressed as a human being. There was no dissociation in relationship at all. So when he acknowledged these devotees, we were at a place called Charlie's Place. It was an island in Fiji before we went to Naitomba Island. And this is actually an extraordinary story that I really want to tell because it's really graphic is that um, I was not one of those devotees that was acknowledged at that time. Um, and everybody was wanting to get acknowledgement from the guru, okay, in terms of being blessed as saying, yes, this experience means that, and therefore you're an advanced practitioner, and therefore you have this role, and then you play this function. You know, that's where the ego politics of religious and spiritual practice come into being, is playing that game with the guru or the teacher or the divine itself playing that game. Um, you're not relating to the process itself with integrity, with heart integrity, integrity, if you get involved with those games. And on this island was a moment in time in which it was decided that, okay, there's these certain practitioners who are showing certain signs of availability to go on what was called the feeling of being retreat. And on this feeling of being retreat, they were given a specific admonition that was about be conscious as the feeling of being. Be conscious as the feeling of being and realize that it is radiant happiness itself. That was the admonition of the yoga, of, of devotees who had been serious practitioners for a long time. And in that retreat, there were many devotees confessing an awakening to this that did, was not lost. In, in other words, they didn't come to after an experience. It was actually something that they felt that they had become consciously capable of conducting and taking responsibility for. It wasn't just an experience, it was a responsibility for and a participation in. And so this was occurring and then there was an acknowledgement of the seven stage transitions and there was initiations happening and celebration. And in the midst of this occurring, um, I of course was <laughs> gutted that, you know, I didn't get to go on the retreat and therefore I was the one that had to end up making the meals, taking care of the kids, cleaning the bathrooms, taking care of the rooms. <laughs> you know, I haven't been as long a practitioner, so I wasn't 
you know, able to participate in all of that. And I would notice, though, that the communications that I would get from devotees as they were describing what they were um, experiencing is that, yeah, but but I, I feel that similarly. But I wasn't blessed to engage that or being acknowledged as being able to to practice that practice and the seventh stage realization. And as was understood traditionally in the context of the guru-devotee relationship, you have to be very, very keenly available to follow the instruction of the guru, even if it rubs you wrong in terms of saying, well, I want to be like that person. <laughs> Can't I... Can't I do that practice? I don't like this practice that you're giving me. <laughs> I'd rather do something else or be somewhere else. Whereas we, we would accept that the process as it was being given by the guru was one that was perfect for us individually. So he never gave a blanket instruction to anybody. It was always unique to each individual. And, that, and that's why he could only work with a few that he called his coins or people that he would work with that could represent certain patterns of humanity. And he would work through them to be able to instruct how to relate to these qualities and these experiences. So I happened to be the one that seemed to be <laughs> the one that was always the underdog. You know, it's like... <laughs> I'm the gross one that just, you know, can, I'll do the very simple things. Well, I'm noticing that I'm having a lot of these phenomenal experiences too, but I'm not getting acknowledged. Okay, well, that's perfect for someone who likes to get a lot of attention, you see. Okay, and so different levels of the being are being worked with simultaneously where you want attention. Okay, take the discipline of not being acknowledged. Take on the certain disciplines that, that counter your addictions to pleasure. So you be celibate longer than some, than the others and all by yourself. You know, those kinds of things. And so at this particular moment in time, I was given this discipline to care for his children, which I loved. And, and the other children. There was a number of, there was probably maybe at least, uh, there was four, five, six, seven, maybe ten children with us at that time. And um, one night, while I was on um, child care duty, um, and a lot of the other devotees were on retreat, it was in the middle of the night that this happened. And uh, we have a mala that we use, similar to other traditions where they will do um, prayer or invocation through making use of the beads. Um, saying mantras or prayers or whatever is a form of remembrance or remembering the practice or the sadhana. And typically speaking, it was um, recommended that you don't wear these things when you go to sleep at night because um, there's a tendency or liability to become unconscious unless you're actually able to practice in this dreaming state and the sleep state which is something that we did develop and experiment with. But at this point in time, um, we, it was recommended that we should typically take these sacred articles off and put them on a sacred altar. Okay? And, um, so, but that night, for some reason, I had a really strong feeling that I shouldn't do that. So I trusted my intuition and I kept it on. So as I fell asleep in the middle of the night, as I rolled over, there, there's what, there's what's called a, um, a main prayer bead or a master bead, the principal bead that's larger than the other ones. And I rolled over and it hit that, it hit me in the middle of the chest and it woke me up. Okay? And as it woke me up, I looked over as I was lying in bed and I noticed out the left side of my eye that there were flames, like fire flames. And it didn't really strike me. I was, I thought, am I dreaming or what? But immediately I realized that there's fire in the building that I'm in. And so, and in the building that I'm in, I'm in bed and there's another woman, Katsu, in the building with me. And we have seven children in the room with us that are sleeping in different beds. So we're on, you know, caring for all the children and, and had put them to bed and they're sleeping. And suddenly I jumped out of bed and I said, Katsu, wake up all the children immediately and get all of us out the door as quick as possible. Because these flames, when I looked over 
and at the bottom of one of the beds, there were flames right at the head of one of the children. And had I not been woken up in that moment, I don't know what would have happened, but I jumped out of bed and I grabbed the feet of this child and pulled him towards me as quick as possible. His name was Neem. And I put him up on my hip, and then I put the other child, who was Namlila, onto my other hip, and I ran out the front door and set them on the ground. And then I ran back in, and I got the other two children that were on the other side of the bed and had them on my hips and ran out the door. And Katsu did the same with the other children that were in the other beds in the front room. And then as soon as I got with the last children on my hip out the door, the building exploded actually exploded, and I went catapulting out onto the ground away from the building. And we sat there with the children and with Katsu and I, and then other devotees in the other buildings running towards us, and we sat there and the whole saw the whole building go up in flames and, and dissolve in front of us. So as we then all went to be with Adi Da, because it was, his children were in that circumstance. And there was, as, as you would imagine, there was weeping, there was shaking, there was trauma, there was what the heck is this about? It was really, really horrifying. But, and I communicated to him what had occurred in that moment. And, uh, you know, in terms of what woke me up. And the interesting part about that, my communication to him, was another moment in which I wanted to get attention and congratulations for what had occurred in that event. And it was in my understanding or acknowledging that, that I realized that there was a binding self-attention wanting to be recognized for my participation in the spiritual process and the mystery of how grace had actually intervened and saved, literally saved our lives. Now that kind of a graphic event is something you will never forget. So the knowledge of my understanding of the way that that grace intervenes, or the mystery of how the spiritual process or God or whatever you want to attribute it to, but the fact that there are unexpected interventions of the divine into the life of individuals is nothing that I can account for or that I deserve or that I can say it's because I believe a certain thing or that I did a certain practice or I am who I am or whatever. You cannot account for it. But in that moment, he explained to us that what was occurring is that he, the, the forces within the force field of our coming into Fiji were um, playing with us, playing with playing with our coming into their field of ownership of the domain. Um, you know, gross mechanism, darker forces that were not necessarily wanting their playing or wanting to see what kind of force of intervention our presence there would be in their domain. And I, some people might think that's crazy to say, but it actually is true. These forces are active in the world today um, and, and at many different levels. So Adida was saying that because of my relationship to him and because of the divine process that manifested not only through him, but the divine itself, I, I want to make that clear, Adida never spoke of himself separate from and identifying as an ego self that what he was doing had anything other than to do with the divine self-condition not himself separately, but the divine self-condition working through him, and that he realized the oneness of that identity that is true of everyone and everything. So he was saying, this is true of you too. And in our communion, in that context of divinity and the divine self-condition, there is the possibility for the intervention of miracles to occur. All sorts of experiences can occur. And this was a graphic moment, again, of showing me that possibility. And then the next morning after we woke up, when we spent hours there with one another, with the parents and the children and with Adi Da and comforting and loving and going beyond the trauma through touch and through, you know, food and through love and through invocation and gratitude, all of that, realizing literally we could have died. 
And then in that moment, the next morning, um, Beloved brought, Adi Da brought the retreat to an end, uh, the retreats to an end. And then um, we sat with him the next morning. And, and I remember d- describing to him that I had a dream where I, um, again, it was a reflection of what occurred, which was that um, I was flying. Again, it was, a, an, it was a lucid dream where I was awake in the dream and I was flying and conscious of the fact that I was um, holding on to Adi Da's toe as I was going through these realms, you know, and it was the, it was the, the acknowledgement in the subtler realm that I had been saved by this grace. And um, so I described to him again in the morning this experience that I had. Um, and then again, I noticed very subtly that I was still wanting this acknowledgement, like I was the one that saved the babies, okay? <sighs> Relentless. Going back to your question is why is it that the realization gets lost? It's the desire for attention, or the desire to grant attention to the separate self, persona, and identity, rather than the yielding and being given over into the divine self position or condition that is the heart of everyone and everything, so there's no separation. Now, it wasn't that people were not grateful for, to me. I'm not wanting, or that he wasn't. There wasn't that kind of thing, but he was giving me some really critically important instruction about the liability of attention either seeking it or wanting it, seeking via attention or wanting attention to the separate self. And then in that moment, I was expecting like cha, or like that was a kind of a cha, or a cha, or an acknowledgement from him, which was a common word that he would use, where he would, um, something that was pleasing to him, that would acknowledge something that was a right relationship to the process itself and to him as the Siddha Guru. And in that moment, he didn't give that to me again. What he said in no uncertain terms and very close to my face is, if you want to realize me, you are going to have to do a whole hell of a lot more than hang on to my big toe. (laughs) That is what requires realization is not an experience but a responsibility for the real sadhana required. So while I've had numerous circumstances or moments in time or experiences of this unqualified feeling of being in the inherent radiance of loveless permeating me and being like literally intervention and penetration of it through every chakra of this being, The responsibility rests in relationship to life itself to be do the sadhana and and be undone in terms of the seeking mechanism of the ego act via the mechanism mechanism of attention. Julie, can you talk a, a little bit about what it has been like for you to be in relationship to him since his death? Yes, yes. So I actually am grateful that I had a period of time where I wasn't physically so close to him 24-7 before he passed away. Being with the liabilities of the gross body-mind, we're always dealing with the fear of death, as if it's going to be a consummate ending. And that everything that we are related to will die. There'll be the inevitable sorrow, the inevitable pain, and the denial even that it's going to happen. Uh, Seeking immortality in various ways to prevent the inevitable death of the one that you love. And Adi Da's teaching is very much combined with the reality process of facing that fact that the beloved, the loved one, dies in this world in the form of an apparent other psychophysical mechanism. Even experience itself is not permanent, the impermanence of everything, and he calls that positive disillusionment. So as I described to you when I first came around him, I I was so in love that I forgot the world. 
And my attachment was so fierce, I didn't ever want to be anywhere else because the feeling of love bliss of his human form and his transmission and this realization was so profound that I had no desire to be anywhere apart from right on his body as much as I possibly could. And yet that didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was it was necessary from the own process of real reality consideration and realization to become a responsibility that I could then do the sadhana required to sustain that gift. So when I left in 1992 unexpectedly, um, because I had been a devotee for long enough, I knew that I could trust his instruction and his blessing that I needed to go and be with Nick because it wasn't arbitrary that I happened to fall in love. You know, and I, and there was no, never any denial relative to what we felt or experienced in relationship to him, no matter who we were. I was considered Adida's woman. You know, I was his lover. You know, so for this to happen, it was a, it was an unexpected thing. So when I accepted that, I had to go through an extraordinary process of release. Even though I was in love with another man, I was still in love with him, which is wholly possible, not only as a man, but also in love with him as the Siddha Guru and with the transmission that he gave. So my life became a process of how do I live in the world with another man and now getting back in touch with my blood family and how do I do that also in love with the guru, even humanly still? And after six years of having been celibate, okay, so it was like, all right, this is, I felt like it was a, I was a cat with another lifetime. You know, it was a whole new paradigm. Okay, this is another life I'm going to have to live and adapt to. And yet I trusted enough that I knew it was significant and important to do so. So to not go into all the reverberations of what occurred for that, it was an extrication of that attachment and also realizing that even though I had lived a profoundly advanced yoga that was associated with the sixth stage yoga of possibilities, um, one thing about the seven stages of life that has to be understood is that even though one can experience these profound yogas, and samadhis and, and experiences, it, if the entire mechanism of the body-mind has not um, become unbound from energy and attention gravitating towards seeking through the different mechanisms of the life structure, the seven stages of life, even as an infantile motive or even as an adolescent or even as a human being or even as a religious practitioner or a mystic or a, a yogi or a gyani, if all of those, if responsibility hasn't been taken for the, um, the karmas of the being being submitted into the yoga and the sadhana of the bright, then you'll be drawn back. You will inevitably be drawn back to have to un handle unhandled business. And this ability to, unhand to handle unhandled business requires you to be in life. So my, I was required to be in the world. I, that was a, a sadhana I had to do. Um, and in doing so, I learned that, um, and he, he participated with me in this every step of the way. That's when I say the relationship didn't end because everything that I experienced, even at a distance, I was in dialogue with him about, as was Nick as with other devotees that I lived with, as was devotees who were still close to him who knew me, as were his children that I was very, very intimate with, you know, and helped raise them. It was, it was a death for me to have to leave because of this proximity and intimacy with all of these devotees who were around him. And yet um, he tried every way possible to see, well, let's see, can you and Nick then come back and actually live in my house together? You know, like, um, because there were men and women who had other intimates at times that might be close around him, and they had children. There were different configurations. In other words, it wasn't a, a, a scripture or a script of any kind that had to be maintained. So um, 
or I would live with Nick. And then we also had to consider at times, well, does Nick want another intimate? Did I want another intimate? Um, was I going to do what work? What service was I going to do in relationship to him and to the, the different gathering, different possibilities within the ashrams that were established or the centers or the households or the communities? So I lived a lot of that. And as that occurred, oh, I can feel it. I feel it. Ah. There's an inherent sorrow that one will always feel at the heart that is part of positive disillusionment that you have to accept that you will not be able to hold on to that which you love. You will inevitably be separated from it. You will inevitably die in this apparent dynamic here. And you don't know how what aspect of manifestation you will appear in again, even as what's experienced when you go into near-death experiences and people feel that they're living or revisiting or combining with different aspects of their previous life or other lifetimes. Well, the unknown of what occurs after you die, um, I also began to become aware of that during this time when I actually left his physical company, that the karmas that I was dealing with were not just with this physical gross body mind, but subtle aspects of the being, of reincarnation or past lives or potentials. Um, all of that was beginning to be dealt with. And then also the synchronous process with awakening beyond that cozy place in the Atman where no experience arises. <laughs> the no and void. <laughs> the bliss of non-duality where you don't have to deal with life. You know, it's like, I have nothing to do with all of that anymore. You know, I'm just going to sit here in this place in the depth of meditation and I'm going to feel this bliss where nothing arises. Well, um, that is still accessed by virtue of the act of attention itself and the sense of a separate self, even though it is extremely minute in terms of the experience of it. So as I went away from his physical company, the process continued in a revelatory fashion that brought me to release that attachment to him physically. So when he passed on, I had a relationship to him that was not about that same level of attachment because I trusted the process at a different and more profound level. And therefore, I was able to um, relate to life as though it wasn't a poison that I had to avoid or, or somehow or in association with it exhibited some level of promiscuousness in relationship to the fidelity to truth itself that I had to be careful to even acknowledge that it existed, you know, like being afraid that I was attracted to this situation or I wanted to s discover what do these practitioners do? So I combined even with other practitioners, other religious spiritual organizations, other teachers in various ways, in, in hearing people's stories, in working in places, you know, that wasn't a sacred space, or I was cleaning houses or ran a business where I was, you know, hosting guests. I mean, I had so many different experiences in life. And every single experience always proved the same thing over and over again, which was the inherent self-authentication of the divine self-condition being the only constant in the midst of any and everything continuing to arise. And this was the truly non-dual reality with eyes open, which is called Sahaja Nirvikalpa Samadhi which is the unqualified samadhi of the bright. And this is why it's actually a samadhi that is actually always already the case and, and open and inclusive of everyone and everything because there's no separate being within it. I mean, we do acknowledge that we exist, right? We very really exist. But there isn't the same assumption that would create conflict within or problems or differentiation or desires that would then create conflict or ownership of politics that would justify the absolute mayhem that we are experiencing, continuing to experience today on this globe. And it continues then. So when he passed away, um, that has, that process has continued. And then the other aspect of it with the cult aspect of it 
is realizing even more profoundly finding myself in the position now that I'm outside the formally acknowledged gathering, you know, that are the ones who are responsible for these treasures of sanctuaries and sacred spaces and his teaching and all the gifts that he gave. And I'm finding that there are the politics of what's still reverberating as the cultic manifestation of Adi Dham is still going on. And I'm having to then be extricated from the dramatization of that cultic attachment, even to the organization that is meant to carry on his work and saying, hey, hello, which I'm not the only one saying this, this gathering is not going to grow and it will, it will inherently not grow because it's not lawful if there is not the true sign of the seventh stage yoga. So that's why we're still a relatively small organization, you see. And even though I'm noticing as time goes on, hundreds of thousands of people actually know about Adida. But there's so much misunderstanding around what happened and why, and why it was communicated out into the world as forms of whatever, you know, which I don't have a problem with. I have no problem with. Because it's just mine, and it, and it makes it has its logic, you know, in terms of why somebody may feel what they do without shame or blame or reaction or making them an enemy. None of that has anything to do, but cultists do that. The cult of pairs creates, for example, exactly what's happening in Israel and Palestine today, and all the wars of the world is based upon the politics of the cult of pairs. And so this is a profundity that I feel is really important to begin to communicate. Um, I don't know if you've seen Adi Da's book about Not To Is Peace, um, which is his communication about the prior unity within which everybody all at once as one must become the voice of humanity rather than that cult of pairs that we give power over to even within ourselves, you know, the voice that wants to be the opponent, that wants to win, that wants to fight, that wants to destroy, that really gets off on conflict. It's ugly, but if you don't see that shadow and you aren't really aware of it and responsible for it, you will only be caught in the active attention and the duality that it creates. So that's, that's Anita. The giver. Julie, it's a wonderful story that you've shared. And uh, I know there's yet another chapter. We haven't really gotten into <laughs> the, the, the expression of Adi Da's teachings since his death. I mean, we've touched on it a little. But what I would like to do is invite you back one more time, at least, to amplify that point, I think it was really the main motivator for you to reach out to me in the first place. Yes, and un unexpectedly, I was, um, I didn't even expect a response because, you know, on YouTube, particularly for individuals who have a fairly large um, and have been engaged in these conversations for a long time, I'm just like, hello, I really appreciate what you're doing. Maybe I could say something. <laughs> so thank you so much. For responding, I'm and, and I'm indebted to you for that. Well, I would say that I'm indebted to you, and the viewers of New Thinking Aloud are indebted to you. You are a gift to the world, and and you have a great deal to share. So I'm very happy that that I responded, and and frankly, I get a lot of emails like that, and most of them I don't respond to at, at all, just for lack of time, but. Uh, I followed my intuition, and I'm glad I did. And uh, I'm very happy we had this time together. And I, I look forward to at least one more conversation with you. I'm open to it, and even if we don't record, you know, I will go to the states at some point, and I'll be happy to. And really grateful to spend time with you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and and for now.
bless you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.